Welcome to the Union Jews Podcast. The UK's only All Things Union podcast, designed for your downloadable digital delight and appreciation. In this episode, Shop Workers Union Rep Alex Wilson and National President Jane Jones on how the union has coped with the pandemic, Mel Sims reports from the front line of community solidarity and trade unionism. And Josiah Mortimer brings us his Radical Roundup. Hello, 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 hello. You're very welcome to Union Jews, the UK's only all things union podcast. I'm Simon Sapper and we've got a cracking episode for you this time round. We're going to be talking to reps from Shop Workers Union Usdor about what the last year's been like following a union report that 90% of shop workers say they've suffered some form of abuse while they've been at work uh, during the pandemic. So we've got Alex Wilson, one of Usdor's youngest uh, reps, and National President Jane Jones to share their experiences with us. We've also got an absolutely outstanding contribution from Glasgow University Professor of Work and Employment Mel Sims on community trade unionism. That's coming up right after this section. And of course, Josiah Mortimer with his always welcome, always revealing radical roundup. Now, thought for the week with Glasgow University Professor of Work and Employment Mel Sims. You'll recall, I'm sure, a couple of weeks ago when the immigration services tried to deport a couple of chaps and pick them up on the south side of Glasgow and immediately found their vehicles surrounded by about 200 people from the local community. Mel was amongst them. And her thought for the week in this episode is all about the links between community activism and trade unionism. Since last podcast, I've had the privilege of participating in an act of community solidarity that's had such resonance that it's hit the national and the international news. On the morning of the Muslim Festival of Eid, two streets from my house in the south side of Glasgow, an immigration raid seized two men with the intention of enforcing a deportation order. Within minutes, a small number of neighbours had surrounded the van and one quick-thinking activist slid underneath the van to prevent it from moving and to buy time for a network of locals to gather. Within about two hours, there were about 100 people present and that grew through the day so that by the late afternoon, my estimate is that there were around three or 400 people um, in the road and, of course, a very heavy police presence. By the late afternoon, early evening, in my view, the standoff could have ended in many many ways and most of them really not that nice. But behind the scenes, local politicians and immigration lawyers were negotiating with the immigration service and with the police so that by six o'clock, the doors of the van had opened and the men were released to a, a local place of sanctuary. And that cheer that went up in the crowd when those van doors opened reinforced every reason for me why community organising is so very, very important. Glasgow as a city has had a long history of grassroots radical activism. And I've only lived here for three years, but I realised very quickly that my trade union networks meant that I had the contact details of many of the protesters who were in the crowd and who were closer to the van than I was. We could exchange messages about what was needed, what was happening around the protest and how the situation was developing. And there are many reasons for hope and joy as a result of the events that day in Kenmore Street. But for me, it reinforced how much unions need communities and communities need unions. Also, how local action is so very deeply embedded in international collectivism and solidarity. And as they say in Glasgow, welcome, because we're all from somewhere. Well, thank you very, very much indeed, Mel, not just for that great piece, but also for, for being there. And, and I don't know about you listeners, but I just thought Mel's piece there was was fantastic. No other word for it. And if anyone listening wants to sample that particular part of this week's show, on their own programs. You can get in touch with us at unionjews at makesyouthink.com. I'm sure we can sort something out. And if you want to 
dig deeper into the area of community trade unionism, can I suggest you listen to one of our older episodes, uh, way back from our first series, when I was chatting with Rebecca Winston from the New Economics uh, Foundation. You can scroll back through past episodes on the podcast platform of your choice. Or alternatively, if you look at the companion blog to this very episode that you can find as ever on the makesyouthink.com website, in that blog post, you'll find a link to the episode in question. Time now for our featured guests, and we are looking at the retail sector in this episode. In a while, we'll be hearing from Alex Wilson, who is a workplace rep for Shop Workers Union Usdor, and then from Jane Jones, who has just started her three-year term of office as Usdor's national president. Usdor, uh, a union, of course, whose members are very much in, in the news. I don't think anyone would have thought of supermarket workers being labelled as key workers, frontline workers before the pandemic, but sure as hell, that's how we see them all now. But it's not been uh, an easy ride at all. Um, obviously, being in the front line never is. But an Usdor report shows that 90% of members who were surveyed said they'd been uh, assaulted or subject to abuse in some way over the course of the, the pandemic. And that, of course, is fuel for the fire of Usdor's campaign to have uh, abuse and assault of shop workers a specific offence identifiable in law. Now, the Scottish Parliament has already started steps to make that reality. In the Westminster Parliament, the government has said, no, nope, not going to do it, not going to not going to play ball on that. And that may be the view of ministers. But there is a petition with over 100,000 signatures that has been presented to us to say that this is a campaign that that really has some support and has has traction. As a union, of course, us is uh, very interesting in a number of ways. Over 400,000 members, one of the larger unions, head office in Manchester, whereas most union head offices are, are well, they're clustered around London still, aren't they? And a, a tremendous recruitment and organising machinery churning 50, 60, 70,000 members a year because of the nature of the sector they work in. Here's Paddy Lillis, our store general secretary, speaking to myself and Becky Wright on the Unions 21 podcast from September 2018. The sheer kind of effort it takes for you guys as a union to stand still in terms of your membership, let alone kind of break through, I think kind of makes some unions go, blindly, we don't know how we would... Well, I mean, I, I, mean, I can't get it. my mind around the scale and the nature of the operations that enables you and your union to recruit 90,000 people last year. It's, I mean, it's bigger than most, most unions, that is numerically. Than <laughs> I mean... I, I, What's the secret? <laughs> yeah, there, there's, a number, there's a number of things. Firstly, we know it's a retail sector and we've got to work at it. Uh, it's not like the industrial, the sort of the heavy industrial side where people join, you know, and they come back to the sort of the days of the big conveners and stuff. We've yeah. got to go in and physically talk to people. That's the first thing. So that's resource hungry in terms of people. Our key first is our reps, our, our, our shop stewards, our health and safety reps and our reps, making sure they get a good experience when they volunteer to come on board as an activist, making sure they get a really good experience at the start. So they get the train, they get their, their eight days training, which is three, three and two mm -hmm. over a period of the first 12 months uh, to get them comfortable and get them confident and give them the knowledge they want to learn more. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing. We take them through how, how, how to recruit and, and organize uh, and do all of that. So that's one side. And that if you invest in them, then it'll pay its dividends yeah. in terms of that's the first thing. And it's a key it's the old knowledge. If you have a workplace and you've got lay reps in there who are confident and skilled, they'll recruit and organize. They're the best ambassadors, yes. aren't they? Yeah. They, of course, it's much more difficult in retail because the convenience se sector, which is the, you know, the, the Tesco Expresses, the yeah. co-ops, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. uh, there's many, many thousands of them stores, so it's not always easy to get a shop steward or a representative in them. So you, we kind of cluster reps in. And yep. we get agreements with employers where one rep can cover four or five stores on locality yeah. uh, and do that. So that helps there. And that's still very much a development stage with us there. We also have an academy, uh, which was set up in 2003. So the 16th and the 17th year. Uh, that's been hugely successful. Uh, that has delivered beyond our awareness expectations. We set it up with 15 people in 2003, and this year we've had 120. Wow. And they're mm. in succumb for six months with us, full six months to come out of their employers. Yeah. So they get a development opportunity and they get accreditation um, through the, the work they do in the classroom on, on TUC organising. Yeah. And 
I mean, out of our 105 full-time officers as organising officers, I think it's nearly 95 or 96 of them come through our academy. So we're That's developing wow. our full-time officers of the future Gosh, as well. Yeah. And not only that, most of the unions have taken them. Yeah. Um, Unison's taken 11. GMB's got about six. Community's got one or two. So I know we're I training them. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. they're going elsewhere. We don't I love, have all the jobs. I, but I like that, though, as well, that you've tracked where they've gone and yeah. what unions <coughs> they're in, and they're part of that kind of framework. I've actually moderated some folders for the yeah. uh, Asdor Academy. Yes. And I yeah. always used to really l- love it because I felt like people tried hard. And they yeah. saw this as an opportunity. This, they saw this as a kind of a, a next step for them, their families. You, you, it always made me kind of quite proud as a trade unionist to get those sort of folders well, and moderate that's, them. Yeah, that's a good story. It is a, it yeah. is a great story. So we'll have that, that, our Academy 1, and then we developed five years after an Academy 2, which is a, a higher level. Uh, so there's more classroom work, and these were getting ready, people ready for the jobs of the future in the trade union movement, and that's been a huge success as well. We're launching uh, in December this year, LA Tutor Academy. So again, mm. Mm. our academy at the minute is directed at full-time officers and, and, and lay officials. The lay tutors more in the training mm. uh, right. and, and classroom. And again, with the cuts to education, trade union education by the yeah. Tories, um, we need to find another way around being able to deliver training. So we're going to train our own people up to be lay tutors, but taking them on a, a development to become teachers. Yes. So we're wow. going to give them the, take them through the qualifications to be teachers. The risk of that is we can't get training jobs for them to go to some other union or they go into schools. Yes. I mean, we're going to give them a proper teaching qualification. So that's just been, uh, that's going to be rolled out in December. We've got everything sorted for that now. And when it comes to recruitment and organising of young members in particular, this is what Patty told us then. Again, from our 435,000 members, 80,000 of their members are under the age of 27. So they're, they're, wow. they're, they're 80, they're, we have more young members in our union than Unison, and Unison's three times bigger than us, and that's lost. Wow. So there's 80,000 young people as actually members of ours, and on top of that, 750 of them, roughly, are shop stewards. So we have a really good base to work with the young people coming forward. Okay, so that's how the Usdor system, if you like, works. But what's it like from the perspective of a young worker, a young activist, coming into the system, into the world of work and into the union? Alex Wilson is someone who was in that position, and she was happy to share her experiences with me. So Alex Wilson from Usdor, thank you for joining us on the Union Dues podcast. It's great to have, uh, ha- have you along. Can I ask... What is your role in Asdor at the, at the present time? Yeah, I am a union representative, so I represent the staff members. Asdor, of course, op- operates across a huge range of different employers and different sized work workplaces. Is your is your workplace a a big one or a little one or somewhere in the middle? We've got a big workplace. I worked at a small one previously, but this is definitely a lot bigger. So yeah, we've got about three hundred plus employees. Wow. Well, I mean, that's significant. So, so, so in your in your role as the workplace rep, there, are you? Do you look after a particular shift, a particular section, or or are you are you part of a, a team that looks after all three hundred? Currently, there is a team of four of us. So we just kind of we get asked to go, and if it's a day we don't work, we see if another person's in. So it's just between the four of us, really. Wow. I mean, even so, that's quite, I mean, that's a large group of members to look after. So, so what made you want to join the union and then actually become become active in it? So I wanted to join because I was, cla- well, I still am a classed as part of the young side of it. And at that time, I felt as though there weren't any young representatives. So I decided to go for it to just see if I could help anyone in any way because there are other places not the company I work for but they take advantage of young people so I wanted to make sure that wasn't happening when I was working. Great and and you're you're probably not typical for younger workers in this in this country at the moment uh, where union density union membership amongst amongst say under 25s is much lower than for over twenty over 25s. Is there a history of trade union activity in your family or is it just something that you just looked at this and thought I'm, I'm not, you know, I need to do something about this and I'm in a position to do it. I actually learned about it in university in my degree. So that's how I kind of knew a little bit 
But when I first joined the union, uh, I didn't know anything about it. Uh, I just joined because uh, someone came to my store and they were speaking to me about it, so I just went with it. But becoming a rep, I knew more by the time I got to that point and thought it was something that people needed to know more about because a lot of young people don't actually know what a union is. Right. So, so I mean, you know, as, as we've been talking, a lot of unions do struggle to recruit younger members. What, what makes Ellsdor different? Was that person, did they have a particular line of chat or were they younger themselves? What's the secret uh, of Ellsdor's success? Because the union as a whole recruits tens of thousands of young people each each year. I know that. I think the difference between ASDA and different trade unions is that ASDA tailor to their audience. So say, for example, you've got an under 25 and an over 40, there's different benefits that are going to suit each person. So when you're saying the benefits, you don't say the exact same things, you cater it more to the person to let them know exactly what may be of interest to them. Right. right. So it's a, it's a tailored approach rather than a one size fits all. I, I get that. But you were saying that someone actually came to your workplace and, and actually spoke to presumably you and the other the other new starts there. And that, so yeah. that access was quite important as well. Uh, yeah, it's called stand down and it happens every so often. So, so therefore, there's a, a variety of tools in the toolbox, as it were. So you joined the union. You were encouraged to become become a rep. What's been the biggest challenge so far? I mean, I'm suspecting it's probably something COVID related, <laughs> related but what are the, the, the biggest hills you've had to climb, as it were? I'd have to say, well, it is COVID. When the first lockdown happened, the other reps in my store went off to Shield because they were classed under the Shielding Group. So I was left on my own. I'd had two sets of training, not loads, but I'd had some but I'd not yet actually done anything in the store. I'd just done the training. So it's it's pretty intense. Managed it, but yeah, it was it was pretty intense getting left on my own to do that. Gosh. So so, so suddenly your team of four is down is down to one. You've got three hundred people and presumably I mean, presumably there's the same old stuff going on all the time. There are, you know, there's a, there are attendance procedures, there are conduct procedures, there, there's loads of new recruits that you need to try and induct or get into the union as well. It, I mean, that's, that is a, a baptism of fire, if I may say so. Is that how it felt at the time? Oh, yes, definitely. It's definitely um, how it felt at some points. It's just like, is this really important? Do you really want to have this meeting right now? And it's all really busy and people are going through things. But yeah, it was. It was intense. I bet it was. Did you find that the that the employer stepped up to the plate, as, as it were, and actually when you said, look, come on, this is not the number one priority at the moment, you'd get a positive response, whereas in normal times they'd have said, no, no, the rules are the rules. Um, for some things, I'd say yes, but others, I'd say no, because there was also the changes of like one person in the store at a time from a family, unless you're a carer or you've got a child, that type of thing. But it wasn't really portrayed down the line how this should be approached. So it was standard. It was just kind of a, a, a do this, but then I don't think they realised exactly what type of verbal abuse we got at the other end because it wasn't portrayed properly. Yeah. Yeah, the, the gap, if you like, between the boardroom and the shop floor, I suppose, becomes quite significant, especially in those, in those circumstances. As we kind of emerge from the pandemic, hopefully, hopefully, what does the, the kind of negotiating and, and organising agenda look like in your workplace? I mean, what will the new normal look like? What challenges will that give in terms of, of your everyday union work? So at the moment, we are going to rerun the election. So um, we're wanting to get more reps in the store. So that's the first thing we're doing is whoever wants to be a rep can put their name down and people vote for them. So we're doing that first because I definitely think for the size of the store that I work in, it's definitely needed. We'll be looking at some form of recruitment uh, as well to see a boost our membership also because that's always what you want to do just to encourage it but I think one of the main things that hasn't happened in quite some time is campaigns because we weren't able to do them so I think looking at some form of campaign to run even if it's around mental health I think that's something that we should definitely be doing at this moment in time since we're able to again. 
Yes, indeed. And, and I mean, do, are you optimistic that there will be a new level of understanding by the employer, uh, and therefore there may be some, there may be a greater degree of buy-in, especially when you're doing things like mental health uh, uh, amongst employees. I mean, not least because whether you're a senior manager or or you're you're a new person through the door stacking shelves. Yeah, mental health issues can attack anyone at, at any point in time. So there should be a community of interest there. Are you optimistic that, if you like, the, the, the gap that you described between the boardroom and the shop floor will narrow and therefore there will be a more consistent application of good policies? I'd hope so. I think the past year and a bit that we've just had should encourage everyone to understand someone else's perspective on what they do for a living no matter their career. So I'd hope There'd be more of an understanding, but I think this is one of the things where only time can tell uh, and we'll have to wait and see. But I'd hope that they understand and appreciate everything that ASDA has done throughout the pandemic and just bear it in mind for any future decisions that they make that may have an impact on the employees. Well, let, let, let's hope so. Let, let's hope so. If we go back to the, the work on recruitment that you, you said you'd hope to get start, started again, the image I have, and you'll tell me if this is right or wrong, is act- actually in the retail trade, especially uh, especially in larger retail out- outlets, there are an awful lot of younger workers. And younger workers coming into the workplace now in 2021 may well have never encountered a union before, may have, well have no idea what a union is. You spoke about there being different approaches for different groups. What's your approach when you're talking to, to these people who are new into the workplace, no idea what a union is? What's the pitch? How do you try and engage with them? Well, the first thing that I do is always introduce myself and say that I'm a union rep and I say my role. And then I first thing I ever ask is, no matter what the age of the person is, I always ask, do you know what a trade union is? Because from that answer, you can then tailor the conversation. So if they say no, I'll then go into a little bit of, well, this is what a trade union, we get leaflets as well. So I tend to always give out a 10 reasons why leaflet, about why to join. But if they're under 25, I tend to ask if they would like to take it home with them and read it with their parents, especially when we've got school people um, with us and late teenagers as well. Just talking to them can kind of put them on. And you don't want someone to join and then withdraw within like a week. So I tend to get them to go away, read it with parents or partners or something, and then I'll catch up with them a couple of shifts in. And I find that to be more effective than just to talk. I mean, this is a bit of a, a, a left field question, as it were. But with with the voting age now being reduced to sixteen in Scotland, does that affect young people's attitudes to a range of other stuff, including work related stuff as well? Does it become, in some ways, an easier conversation because if you vote at sixteen, suddenly you think, actually, you know, I'm I'm an adult much sooner, two years sooner than I was expecting to be otherwise. And I wonder if that flows through in terms of recruitment work. I've not really seen it. What I've noticed is that if you learn about trade unions in fifth and sixth year, so if they've taken history in school, it makes it a bit quicker to talk to them about it. I've not yet seen anyone say, well, I'm 16, I can vote. I know what I'm doing type thing, yet it's more if they've learned about it in school or if a family member is also a representative in a trade union. But that's really all I've seen so far. No, I I think think the family link is really, really important. When that link was broken by the mass unemployment of the 1980s, I think that was a real seismic moment for for trade unions. But there we go. I'm just showing my age there, I think. In terms of your own trade union journey, Alex, what does the future hold for you? Where would you where would you like to go? How high would you like to go in, in terms of Usdor's structures? If I'm honest, I quite prefer just being where I am. I don't think I would go any higher, but that's just because I like to speak to the employees, like just the way I am. Uh, I enjoy doing what I'm doing. I know what I'm doing now since I've just been kind of thrown into it. So I, I don't think I'd like to go any higher, but that doesn't mean I wouldn't want to know more. So learning more would be one of my hopes with it. I just don't think I'd want to rise up the chain. No, I know there's always a problem, isn't there, that, that you can exert more influence, but you can get further away from the members, and it's a, it's quite a difficult ba- balance, balancing act. I, it's been a great pleasure to chat with you, Alex, and, and the contribution that you and people like you can't be overestimated. It's absolutely the, you know, the bricks in the mortar of trade union structure. So thank you for the work that you do, and hopefully we'll 
will continue to do. And I wish you well in increasing the, the number of members and the number of reps to, to make the work go around more more evenly. Well, thank you very much for having me on as well. It's been a great experience. Well, crikey, what an introduction to trade union life for Alex there, suddenly being on your own in the, those circumstances with all those members looking to you for support and leadership and so on. But let's find out now what the view is from the office of the national president of the union. Jane Jones has just started her three-year term of office and like Alex, was happy to share her experiences. It's my great pleasure to welcome onto the podcast, Jane Jones, the president of, of Usdoor. Jane, very welcome to the podcast. Oh, hi, Simon. Thanks for having me. I mean, Jane, I know you've just taken over as president, having been elected early, earlier in, in the year. What's been your union journey, as it were? What got you into the union? What would have been the staging posts, as you like, as, as you get to the summit of, of the union in terms of its elected positions? Well, when I first joined the company I worked for 17 years ago, I joined the union on my induction and immediately I saw the relationship that the company had with the union and how they work quite closely with things. Obviously, through the first few years of my employment, you see certain injustices and the way people are treated and the union reps' involvement in how those situations were resolved. So as soon as I could, really, when there became a vacancy, I stood to be a union rep which was, I think, 2014. So kind of that's, that's quite a, uh, a steep curve then, isn't it, from, from being a rep for the first time seven years ago to being a president of one of the largest unions in the country now. Was it, was it simply a question of, of as, one, as you walked through one door, you saw several others opening before you, or were there particular campaigns or did people act as mentors for you? How, how did it work from that point on? Um, I think I had a really good area organiser. She was very supportive. She encouraged me a lot. And with the company that I work for, there's lots of opportunities to be on different consulting bodies, which I sit on. So I was always, as one thing happened, something else came straight after. Mm, so mm. yeah, you're right. It's one door opens and then another one. And I sort of took to it like a duck to water, really. I felt, you know, like I'd found something that I really had a great passion for, that I was good at, I enjoyed, and that it was really helping people. And I think it came at the right time in my life as well. My children were growing up and, you know, I had the time and, you know, the energy to do something. And I just, it just sort of went from there really right i mean but but i mean i mean did you did you come from like a union family as it were were you were, you, were your parents active union members or is it just something you you found yourself being in an environment that seemed seemed just right for you when you when you started with us all well, I mean, I grew up in Liverpool in the 1970s and my dad was an ambulance driver and I think it was probably early 90s. There was a, a strike, there was a lot of industrial action and he was involved in that. I mean, he wasn't a massive union activist, but from then, from that point, really, I saw, you know, how how people could be treated and, you know, what the difference a union was in the workplace. And, you know, obviously it helped my dad in, in his employment and throughout his career. So, yeah, it was always there, but it was not something that I really had a massive involvement with until I joined the company I work for now. And just just thinking back to when you did join your, your current employers and you, you joined almost as part of your induction process, was that because the union and the employer had a deal that allowed the union to to participate in the induction process? Was it someone who approached you or did you have to go and hunt hunt down the local rep and say, give me a form? No, it's part of the induction. So they have an agreement that there's a, a slot in the induction for a union rep to come in and it was the store union rep, which always helps. So, you know, there was a face to the union and there always has been really. So they came in and I think out of all the people that were in the induction, we all joined. So I think there was about a dozen of us and we all joined at the same time. Well, it just shows how, how effective and important that sort of opportunity can be. So your president is a three year term of office. What, what do you want, what do you want to make happen? Well, I mean, Simon, it's really only just sinking in that I actually was elected. You know, there was a number of people standing for the position um, and I've only just taken over in May. But primarily, really, my priority would be to promote the campaign New Deal for Workers, which is one of us doors main campaigns. And hopefully we could, you know, move that forward, drive that forward with the government and get things going for our members and other people. 
the main the main points for it are um, ten pound minimum wage for all workers, a minimum contract of sixteen hours for per week for anybody who wants one. Obviously, there might be some people who only want a small contract if they only work want to work one day a week due to other commitments, but a minimum of sixteen hours, a normal hours contract which reflects the actual hours that you work regularly so you know being contracted for not just seven hours but you always work 25 a ban on zero hours contracts you know there's too many people on zero hours contracts who actually work a lot of hours every week and the government really do need to ban zero hours contracts once and for all better sick pay um, a proper social security system job security, fair treatment for all workers and actually a voice at work. But the main four ones, really, the main points are, you know, the minimum hours, minimum hourly contracted rate of pay and a normal hours contract for people. Yeah, I mean, it, we, we we do see and hear an awful lot about people who are in the in the retail sector who are on eight hour contracts when they're regularly working 16, 32 hours. Uh, and, it, it, you know, it does seem it does seem bizarre that that we're still in a position where people can't have a contract that reflects what they actually do rather than rather than than some f- almost fictitious figure. I, I store as a union has always been very involved politically as affiliated Labour Party for a long period of time. Does that mean that as well as an industrial dimension to the campaign, you see that there's necessarily a political one as well? Yeah, most definitely there is a political aspect to the campaign as well. Yeah, I mean, we have just done a petition and we got over 100,000 signatures for the campaign. So obviously it is going to be put in front of the government, you know, to, to be addressed. It's something that we've tried before and we weren't successful. But, you know, we've done it again. We've got over 100,000 signatures um, and we just need to, you know, get it heard and hopefully get the support there. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that, and, and passing the 100,000 threshold, of course, shows the level of support that there is for for the union's position on this. Um, so, Jane, uh, some of our listeners may already uh, have seen you through TV and, and in particular your interview for ITV about the abuse that shop workers were suffering during the beginning of the uh, of the pandemic have have things got better since then have the public actually cooled down generally and irrespective of of, of how the customers are are employers as supportive as you would wish them to be yeah, I mean, th- things have definitely gotten better. They've definitely improved. I mean, I've described it as we've gone through peaks and troughs. Every time the government have changed the rules or the recommendations, customers' frustrations have, you know, risen and they've taken it out on the people on the front line, if you like. So apart from the swearing, the intimidation, the threatening behaviour, the things being thrown at you, yeah, that has all really died down. People are... Still not really very good at social distancing. People don't like to wear masks. They don't like being told where to go, where to stand, um, things like that. But it's definitely improved without a doubt. The employers have been really supportive. They were quite quick to react, to be fair. And there wasn't really a guidebook at the beginning. So, yeah, whilst we've got criticisms of things that they could have done better and quicker, no one was really prepared for it. Whenever we've had incidents of abuse or violence you know it's been dealt with straight away so I can't really criticize for that other than it's really not acceptable for anyone to go to work and be abused whether it's in a shop an office a doctor's surgery anything like that really but it was so commonplace that it became normal it was the fact that I'd phone home and I'd make a joke and say oh I've only been sworn at twice today it's been a not bad day and looking back at it now you think oh my god that was so bad why was that why was that not a bad day that I was I was sworn at twice Whereas now it's, you know, it's maybe once a week, once a fortnight, I might get a bit of, a bit of um, an angry customer about something. But yeah, it's, it's been quite bad, quite bad, but it is getting better. Well, that's 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 a relief a relief to hear. It has been taken to a round table, and people are talking about it, and you know, people are aware about the the abuse that shop workers have and key workers have you know put up with during the pandemic over the last what fourteen months or something. So yeah, one of the things that Lusdor has a particular uh, and justified reputation for is the ability to recruit and engage young members and young workers, and then to develop uh, probably more young reps than any other union. What do you think is the secret of the union's success in engaging with young people? Um, I mean, primarily, I think 
one of the things is that the actual sector that we work in, a lot of the people that work in retail are young workers. They are part time workers. They're students. My daughter, when she was 17, she joined the same employer I work for and she became a shop steward straight away. <laughs> so she, she's also followed in my step, footsteps quite quickly for a number of years while she worked there. <laughs> Sometimes it can be really hard to engage with people, but young workers do seem, once they do engage with you, they do seem, seem passionate. I mean, we've got over 600 young reps under the age of 27 across the country supporting our members. Wow, that, that, that's excellent. Is there like a, almost like a toolbox that the union has that it, that it, and it adapts particular approaches for particular places or particular demographics? Or is there a kind of just one like master strategy that, that, works and therefore is retained and 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 is almost self-perpetuating well i think i think you you know you address the audience that's in front of you obviously if it's retail workers industrial workers distribution workers what whatever they are you know you you're speaking to your audience if you like but really there is just one toolbox it's all about you know giving support in the workplace obviously depending on the company working in partnership with the company you work for negotiating your terms and conditions like anybody else but there is just you know one set of tools our store traditionally has been based on long established retailers but of course there is a lot of diversification in the sector and in particular a lot of new jobs in the sector tend to be not customer facing in the sense they're in distribution centers and warehouses has our store been effective at being able to follow the trends in the development of, of the sector yeah i mean it, the, the sector is changing the high street is changing jobs are changing so we've just got to adapt we've got to make sure that our members are ready to take on new new roles however they you know it may change um that they have the skills that they're taking for the new roles so like you say it may not be a job on the high street anymore it might be in a distribution center so yeah so we're constantly adapting to the new kinds of workplaces where we're going to be representing our members and is is that movement the changing nature of the high street something that that usdor has a particular view on in terms of what the government response should be well, we, we have got a campaign, which is um, Save Our Shops, which is all about how the high street is changing. Um, we have ideas on how the government can support the high street. I mean, people use the high street for different things, whether it's just, you know, for elderly people to be able to get out. Not everybody does shopping online. So, yes, we, we do have things that we'd like the government to do and simple things like look at business rates car parking charges things like that but there's definitely something that needs to be done otherwise there won't be a high street yes yeah uh, yeah indeed i mean i think it is an existential uh, problem that we that, that that we're dealing with here hopefully as we move out of, out of uh, the pandemic and lockdown gets eased very considerably then things things will all relax across the uh, across across the piece um jane thank you very much indeed for for sharing your insights and and good luck for the, your your three years as president of the union and and hopefully the things we've spoken about will will come will come to pass and you'll get to the end of your term of office and look back and think yeah that was a good three years work and i'm sure that's what will happen Oh, thanks, Simon. I can't really wait to get going, to be honest with you. And, you know, my main aim is just to make a little bit of a difference and do everything that I can in the three years that I've got my, my seat. Well, my thanks to Jane and, as I say, to, to Alex. And I think what comes out of those discussions, uh, uh, first of all, that there's clearly a very robust, well-developed structure that enables reps to come in and engage with new employees and then also to be able to represent them through well-established consultative procedures that are clearly embedded in the employer's culture, which is, you know, that's uh, now that's not a panacea a long way from it, as we heard uh, Alex and Jane both, both say. But nevertheless, it provides a platform on which to build membership, negotiate good deals, have a more partnership approach to uh, employee relations than might otherwise be the case. So very interesting to hear from the inside about about how it works, not just in terms of the union's organising and recruitment work, but also the experiences that reps have. And just to go back over some of the things that Jane particularly was talking about, uh, Oslo's New Deal for Workers, the campaign to save the high street, and the campaign for legislation to protect shop workers. You can find links to all those campaigns in the companion blog to this podcast, which you can find on the makesyouthink.com website, or alternatively, if you visit the Usdor uh, website, which is usdor.org.uk, you'll find them well signposted from the front page there. 
If you have your own experiences of working or organizing in the retail sector, if you've got comments or ideas or points of view about what we've been talking about, we would love to have your contribution. You can email the show at unionjews at makesyouthink.com. You can tweet us at Jews Union. What are you waiting for? Come on, join in the conversation. And now with some worrying news on jobs, but some good news on a union win in the Northwest, here's Josiah Mortimer with his Radical Roundup. Thanks, Simon. First up, the unemployment rate for ethnic minority workers has surged to 8.9% over the past year, compared to a far smaller increase among white people. Around 1 in 10 BME people are now unemployed, compared to fewer than 1 in 20 white people. TUC General Secretary Francis O'Grady said, everybody deserves a decent and secure job. Unions representing 750,000 council and school support staff across England, Wales and Northern Ireland have slammed a 1.5% pay offer made by the Local Government Association. GMB, Unite and Unison submitted a joint pay claim to the Local Government employers in February for a 10% pay rise that would be payable from 1st of April 2021. The unions say the joint claim for a 10% rise is vital to put a stop to poverty pay in local government and schools and to recognise the crucial role played by staff during the pandemic. Unison's head of local government, John Richards, said it was a disappointing offer from the local government employers. Unions will now discuss the offer with their national local government committees before formally responding. It's likely they'll want the employers to think again and come back and negotiate a stronger offer. In union leadership news, Michelle Stanistreet has been returned unopposed to serve a third term as General Secretary of the National Union of Journalists. The journalist leader was first elected General Secretary in 2011 when she became the first woman in the NUJ's history to lead the union. Michelle Stanistreet said it had been an honour to serve as GenSec and she was proud of the work of the NUJ and the union's rich legacy. A union victory now as bus drivers at Go Northwest in Manchester have defeated attempts to fire and rehire them after agreeing a deal which will end one of the country's longest-running industrial disputes. The deal was presented to a mass meeting of the drivers last week at the company's Queen's Road depot. It was followed by a workplace ballot where the union's members voted overwhelmingly to accept the negotiated agreement, bringing to a close the 85-day strike. Crucially, the companies agreed to Unite's demand that it will never use fire and rehire in any form, a move that will safeguard paying conditions for thousands of employees across the go-ahead group. The deal was struck following high-level negotiations led by Unite Gensec Len McCluskey with senior company representatives at Go Northwest's parent company. The strike began with all-out continuous action starting in February. Len McCluskey said it was a tremendous victory by Unite's members. And that's all from this week's Radical Roundup on the Union Jews podcast. You can find the full Radical Roundup on leftfootforward.org on Wednesday. Thanks very much, Simon. Back to you. Many thanks, Josiah, and I'm particularly grateful to Josiah this week because he's delivered the Radical Roundup despite spending most of the week in a tent in the southwest of England, which, given the <laughs> given the lousy weather we've had over the last seven days or so, is no mean feat indeed. And excellent news from Unite in the Northwest having defeated that fire and rehire proposal and got such a good commitment from the employers that it's it's off the table, not just not just in the Northwest, but for all the company's subsidiaries in the UK. And congratulations to Michelle on her re-election as General Secretary of the NUJ. When I recorded a podcast with Michelle for Unions 21, uh, together with Becky Wright, she told us that it wasn't a question of her wanting to run to be the General Secretary. She said she knew she had to run uh, for the post because of various circumstances that applied at the time. You can catch up with that discussion at uh, unions21.org.uk forward slash ideas forward slash podcast well that's about it for this episode thank you so much for spending your valuable time in our company for the last half hour 40 minutes or so hope you've enjoyed what you've heard hope it's made you think let us know what you do think ideas for future guests ideas for future shows things that you thought mm, didn't really work so well don't try them again you can email the show at union jews at makes you think dot com you can tweet us at jews union and it would be great if you could subscribe to the show or leave a review of the show or both on the podcast platform of your choice thank you very much indeed Union Jews is part of the Labour Radio Podcast Network. That's a collection of 100 shows linked to trade unions and the issues that trade unions deal with. You can access all those shows through a common portal, which is at labourradionetwork.org. That's all one word and no you in Labour. So finally, my thanks to my guests this week, to Alex and to Jane. 
My thanks to Josiah and Mel for their great and much appreciated contributions. My thanks too to Becky Wright, Executive Director at Unions 21, uh, for giving me access to those Union 21 podcasts. And we'll be back in a couple of weeks' time when we'll be dealing with all things data. We'll be talking to someone who has a unique job title in the trade union movement. They are a head of data. What does that mean? What does it involve? How do you get to be a head of data anyway? All that coming up in our next episode, which will drop on the 8th of June. Till then, stay safe, look after yourself, look after each other. And I'll see you next time on Union Jews. The Union Dues podcast is presented by me, Simon Sapper. It is a Makes You Think production.